right, how are we doing today? So good to see you. My name is Russ. I get to be the senior pastor here at Resurrection Church. Uh, I got a week away last week. The elders decided that I needed to go away with my wife and not have three kids tugging on us for a while and get some time to refresh and get ready for the fall. Uh, this is a big week for multiple reasons. One is that school starts again uh, this Wednesday. So uh, all parents rejoice uh, teachers ready or not, here they come back. We've done our best with them, but now it's your turn for a while. Uh, we're excited for that. So here's what I want to do We're in, in just a second. If you're a teacher, uh, we do want to pray for you as you get ready to do this sacred and incredible work this week of teaching our little ones. We want to pray for our schools for a minute. Uh, really proud of those of you who maybe made it over to North High. They actually prayer walked the campus getting ready for that. And so in just a few minutes, we're going to pray together. Uh, and pray for our school year. Secondly, uh, we uh, have distinctives as a church or values. And so on your way here today, you probably drove past, uh, you know, three, four, half dozen, 12, 15 churches to come here. And the question that I always challenge people to ask is why? And it's kind of a scary question because to be honest with you, some people, when I ask that question, leave the church. They're like, I don't know why I'm driving here. Uh, but when it comes down to it, our, our prayer and for you, especially if you're a follower of Jesus, is that you don't just go to church because it appeases you, but you feel a need or a pull to be a part of that church, that you sense a, even, dare I say, the word calling, uh, to be a part of a church where you would break bread, use your gifts, sacrifice your time, and live your life in communion with the other believers that are a part of that particular fellowship. And for us, what we desire to do is always line out kind of our distinctives and values so that you can know some of the things that we major on. Now, we've said this before, it's our desire not to compete with other churches, but to complement. And we believe that our uh, ultimate victory as a community is when our churches uh, discover the nuances for why God has allowed them to exist in the neighborhoods and areas in which they exist. And then they collectively, as a community, rise up using the gifts that they have together within the people of their church to then go out and serve their community well. And so we have several distinctives and values. And one of those big distinctives for us is that we are going to be a church that is intentionally multicultural. Now that raises some questions as to what does that even mean. And, and essentially what that means for us is that we pay attention to the demographics around our campus uh, both ethnically and economically. And we, if we do not see a microcosm of the ethnic breakdown of the community within around a seven or eight mile window of this campus, then that means we become a commuter campus. Meaning you drive into church here, but you don't actually live in the community around here. And as a result of that, it makes it tough for us to actually reach people within an arm's reach of our community. So for instance, if the community around this campus, not saying that it is because I actually don't have the demo in front of me at the moment of what our actual ethnic breakdown is, but let's say it's 60% Hispanic and our church is made up of 2% Hispanic, well that shows a mission gap, meaning like we have a mission field around us that we're not engaging in a healthy way. Does this make sense? Because some of you, whenever you hear me say multicultural, you just think that we're looking for people that are not whatever the predominant ethnic group is, and we're pointing them out and going, see, we're multicultural. That's not what we're doing. There's actually math behind it. Believe it or not, we actually believe in math at the church. Our government doesn't, but we do. Um, the numbers should line up. Uh, that's funny. Uh, so... Uh, We've been praying about how do we continue to reach out to be a better representation of the diversity around our campuses. And so there's an experiment going on at 11 o'clock and 9 o'clock at downtown today. And uh, essentially, we are pushing into the ground of trying to reflect Revelation 7-9 here and now. Revelation 7-9 says that in the end, every tribe, nation, tongue will be around the throne of God and worshiping Him as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the future church. And so we've been praying about, well, what does it look like for us to emulate that now uh, with what God's called us to be as a community? And so today, uh, Julio Regla, our youth intern, who is really tired. Yeah, yeah, five claps for the youth intern. That's awesome. Uh, five people are excited we have a youth intern. Everybody else is like, okay. Uh, he, he just took 60 kids with our youth team uh, to the coast yesterday. They had a beach day at the coast. The last time I saw him uh, before this moment this morning was him getting buried by all of our teenagers. So the fact that he's here is a slight miracle. 
But uh, 9 and 11, he's going to translate in everything I say from the message into Spanish. And uh, we're going to experience that as a church at 9 and 11. And then coming up on September the 15th, we're going to start pushing towards having a service where you hear both English and Spanish in it uh, sprinkled throughout that. We're going to do it on the 15th. Then five weeks from the 15th, we're going to do it again. And then five weeks from that date, we're going to do it again. And then we're going to see how this works. We've got some technology that we're trying out where you could have earpieces to where multiple languages could be heard as I'm preaching the message to, so that they would have an earpiece and they could hear. And we want to continue to try and do everything we can to reach the, the groups that are around us, even if they do not speak our own native tongue. And so we're working and pushing forward to doing that. It may not be your thing, which may mean that, you know, maybe Resurrection Church is not your thing, and that's okay. But for some of you, this may be your thing. You have a heart for this. We believe putting a, a language group like over in the chapel or starting a service with, a, with a, a language group that speaks a different language doesn't make us one church. It just means we started another church. So instead, we want to be one church, and we want to worship together, and we believe that in heaven, we're going to hear this beautiful sound of a multicultural people uh, that are worshiping this Savior that has redeemed them by His blood, and we want to practice that and get ready to do that, and so we're going to start pushing towards seeing what this looks like. Let me be very clear. This is an experiment. We do not know what we're doing. Some of you, <laughs> some of you are thinking it, like... They don't know what they're doing. No, we don't. I mean, but we're trying to honor God and, and lead at the leadership of His Spirit. Are you tracking with me? If you're a teacher, uh, would you stand to your feet and let us honor you and pray for you? Uh, whether you homeschool, teach publicly, if you're getting ready for the school year, would you just stand to your feet? Can we give it up for all of our teachers? Yeah. I love, I love that there's like... The last two or three stood up after they were sure everybody else was. So if you'll stay standing, if you'll stay standing while we already have you there. I know it was a, a, a long road for the introvert to get from, you know, sitting to standing. But uh, if you could just gather around some of these teachers and uh, extend a hand towards them. If you know them, put your hand on them. And I just want us to take a few minutes and pray over our teachers and over our students as we get ready for the school year. Uh, if you want to move, you can. If you want to stay where you're at, you can. Uh, let's pray together. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be silent. You pray, and then after a few moments, we will pray together. So God, we lift all of our schools and all of our students to you and our teachers. And God, we thank you for the blessing of this school year that is on the horizon. We first and foremost thank you for the education opportunities that our kids have to learn, to grow, as they continue to discover who you've created them to be and the call that you have on their life for how they will serve your kingdom one day. And God, we pray uh, for the teachers as they prepare to use the gifts that you've given them and to walk in the calling that you call them to. And we pray over their classrooms. We pray that for every seat that is filled with a little student and a little mind, that you would give them a heart of compassion and mercy and grace towards that kid. We pray that you would stir their heart to love them well to teach them with patience and kindness, to be merciful to those who perhaps are a challenge to them in this coming year. And God, in that, I pray that through your Holy Spirit, uh, though they may not be in a place where they can openly teach and talk about your name, I pray that your presence would clearly mark and allow the character of your presence to come through their teaching, their demeanor. And I, I just pray for a peace in their classroom that perhaps for a student who's in turmoil, who, to, who in the next few days will walk in to that classroom, would you give them a sense of peace as they come into a place of stability, perhaps for the first time in several months. And so God, we pray for these teachers. We thank you for them. We thank you for the call you have on their life. And we pray that you would bless this school year in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you guys so much. <clears throat> Romans chapter 11. As you're getting back to your seats and we're opening up God's Word together. Romans 11, that's where we're going to go today. Uh, so uh, as we're opening up this letter, I want to read the end of chapter 10 and the beginning of chapter 11. To, or the, excuse me, the beginning of chapter 10 and the beginning of chapter 11 side by side. I want you to see the common theme here of what Paul is talking about. In fact, um, 
I, I won't go back to nine, but he does it in nine too. But as you're go, going to Romans 11, let me read you the first verse of Romans 10 again before we read the first verse of Romans 11. Romans 10, one, it says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, that is the nation of Israel, the Jews, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Okay. So we're talking about in this theme of the study of the book of Romans we're at, Paul has uh, succinctly and linearly gone through the details of what Jesus has done to reconcile and offer salvation and fulfill the prophecies that were prophesied in the Old Testament about him so that we now uh, could be people of the new covenant, having the law fulfilled by the work of Christ and now being found in Christ, we can now live not condemned by the law, but freed by the blood. And he's laid this out very succinctly for everyone to understand, whether you're a Gentile or Jew, that it's the same blood that reconciles and brings us to being one family and brings us into uh, the goodness and the grace and the salvation of God. Are you tracking with me? Now, uh, he then, in chapter 9, goes into great detail about those who perhaps were familiar with the promises of God, They've grown up in the heritage of the promises of Abraham and the, in the, in the uh, covenant with Moses and, and the Old Testament covenants that we see who are awaiting on the Messiah, but they have rejected Jesus. Because keep in mind that when Paul writes the letter to the church in Rome, it's 25 years into his ministry and the majority of the nation of Israel has rejected Jesus as Messiah and gone back to Old Testament law way of living and believing. Are you tracking with me? And as a result of that, Paul is taking the time to say, okay, did God fail them because the majority of them walked away? Did God fail them because the majority of them do not believe? Uh, what, what, what should we surmise about God's promise, God's work, and, and what God continues to do and offer to the nation of Israel? So Paul is speaking in 10 to them, and then you pick it up in verse 11, and it seems like he's on the same idea. It's like he circularly is bringing up, has God failed, and then gives some expounding ideas as to why God has not failed, and then he brings it up again. Has God failed? Or has God uh, not come through on his promise or come short of that? And so Romans 11 is where we're going to kick in. And we're going to see in these 14 verses that we're going to look at today, we're going to see two major things. Number one, we're going to see God's work with the remnant versus the rebellion of the majority. We're going to see how God has a track record of working with a remnant, even when the majority around that remnant is in rebellion. That's the first thing we're going to see. The second thing that we're going to see in these 14 verses is God's discipline and how it differs from God's punishment. So we're going to see the difference between discipline and punishment. And this is good for us because it's good for us to know the difference between when God is disciplining and God is punishing. And if you are being punished by God, let me just go and extend to you that there's, most of you are not. <laughs> because when God punishes, it's a lot more brutal than you think. So let, let me just extend that to you as a warning as we get to it. So. Uh, we're going to look at these two things. The first thing, God's work with the remnant versus the rebellion of the majority. This is what we're going to see in the first six or seven verses as we go into Romans 11. Romans 11, 1, it says this. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite and a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. So first apologetic Paul brings up, has God rejected Israel? His answer is no, because I am an Israelite and I walk with God. So if I, being an Israelite, have been saved by Jesus, then God has not rejected Israel because in order for him to reject the nation of Israel, it would mean that he would have to dismiss me being an Israelite. Does this make sense? Now, we, we tend to work in cultural norms that broad stroke everything. So, uh, for instance, let me make it small and not political so that it's not offensive and I can move off of it quickly. Uh, many of you have older brothers and sisters. Anybody? Older brothers and sisters? Raise your hand if you have them. Okay. Some of you have brothers and sisters that were like Ernest T. Bass of your family. <laughs> Anybody remember Ernest T? Anybody remember the episode where the glass workers are carrying the glass and Ernest T's running around with rocks? And he, 
throws the rock in. Okay, all right. Some of you, that is your family. Like that, that's who you are. Now that's not you, but that's the people around you. And as a result of it, when you walked into Mrs. McNeely's first grade class, you had a reputation not based off of the character of who you were, but based off of the actions of who your siblings were. Anybody ever had to live with this? And as a result of your siblings' behavior, you then get uh, uh, less uh, leverage, less, uh, you, you get less opportunity uh, perhaps than you would get from an, a teacher that had no understanding of who your crazy brother or sister was that came before you. And so the entire family gets a bad name because of the actions of a few. Does this make sense? Uh, so what Paul is saying is that God has not dismissed the entire family of Israelites because of the actions of a few, that God has received many Israelites, that God's been faithful to the nation of Israel as his people, as the people that he gave the covenants to. And those covenants were covenants that he gave them so that in the Abrahamic covenant, they would be blessed by the presence of God and the provision of God so that they would be a blessing to the nations around him. So that through what God did with a people, the nations around them, get this, would see that envy and even be jealous of it to the point of coming and saying, teach me about your God. God blessing a people to the extent that literally the nations would see and go, I need to know who is the God that is able to provide for a people like that. Are you tracking with me? So Paul brings this idea up again. I asked then, has God rejected his people? By no means, I myself am an Israelite and a descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Now he's gonna get into the remnant idea though. This idea that you could have a crowd and in the crowd, the majority may be doing one thing, but there's a remnant within them that have not followed in that way of thinking. So here we have in this illustration, all of Israel and there's a remnant, some of the people who are ethnically Israel who have become followers of Christ and they've received him as Messiah. They received him as savior and they are now in this new covenant along with the Gentiles who have been brought in by the work of of the Holy Spirit. So verse two gets into how this is not new, this idea of God taking a remnant out of the mass of people. Verse two, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah and how he appeals against Israel? Verse three, quotation, Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars and I alone am left and they seek my life. All right, let's get context around where that's at. One of my favorite stories in all the Bible is the story of Elijah and the bell priest, the altar build off. Anybody ever read this story? It's back in 1 Kings. It picks up in uh, chapter 18 where God uh, sends Elijah to the bell priest. The nation of Israel is worshiping this demonic God that has been created by man. And as a result of it, they now no longer worship the one true God. They worship this created God created by the hands of man. Uh, Elijah, one prophet, only prophet left. They've put every other prophet to the sword and killed them. So Elijah comes and this, uh, all of the prophets of Baal are there and he challenges them to an altar build off and the true God who is real, Baal or Yahweh, will send fire from heaven and consume whichever altar is the altar of the true God, whichever one's representing who the real God is. So the bell priest, they dance around their altar uh, and nothing happens. By verse 27 in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah's making fun of them, uh, which is very Christian of him to do. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure he said, bless your heart. It just didn't translate over <laughs> in Hebrew, which means it's completely okay. Uh, it says, at noon, Elijah mocked them saying, cry aloud for he, for he is a God. Either he is musing or he is relieving himself or he is on a journey or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. So uh, this entire thing plays out that gets really dark and grim. I'll save those details for later for you to read it on your own. Uh, but uh, Elijah then at the evening time calls the entire nation of Israel that's been worshiping the bell 
uh, the image of Baal, uh, over to this altar. They drench it with water. He looks up to heaven and fire comes from heaven and consumes the altar. This is an amazing moment, right? Then all of a sudden there's a Jezebel and Jezebels always make their way into every story and ruin stuff. And she sends a threat that she's going to end Elijah's life for what he's done. And Elijah goes from having this mountaintop moment where it's like, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do, to running and pleading for his life. You ever been there? Like, can we not relate to this story? Where there's been a moment where God was so palpable and real that we thought that we had a faith that could never be shaken, only to find the next chapter a moment where everything got shook? This is where Elijah is at. As a result of it, if you skip down to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 38, uh, after, excuse me, 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, verse 14, this is what Elijah says. I've been very zealous for the Lord. This is right after the fire comes in verse 38, consumes the altar. Jezebel sends her uh, uh, threat. And this is what happens in verse 14. I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. Verse 18 in 1 Kings chapter 19. Yet I will, uh, excuse me, before I get there, that, that was the good point. All right, so 14, in verse 14 of chapter 19, he says, essentially, why are you dealing with Israel kindly? They've killed your prophets. They worship idols. They've remained in idol worship. Why do you continue to be gracious? Any of you ever asked that question about somebody else? Any of you ever know that you're, there's people around you, perhaps even your own mother, that's asked that question about you? <laughs> God, why do you continue to give me restraint? Why do you continue to be Gracious. This is the question that Elijah raises that Paul is actually talking about in Romans chapter 11. And what he teaches us in this, in verses 2 to 4, are a few things. A few things. Uh, first, God doesn't condemn all because of the majority. Look at verse 2 again with me. It says this uh, You know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? And this is what comes in 1 Kings 19, verse, uh, verse 18. He's quoting it here. Look at it again in verse 4. Uh, he says, but what, what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So at the present time, there is a, and here's the word, a remnant that are chosen by grace, the, the, a remnant that are chosen by grace. It's not that they had great willpower, it's that the grace of God kept them from bending their knee to an idol. And as a result of it, we get this idea of a remnant. And then verses five and six, six teach us some lessons of grace. Look at what we learn about grace here. So to the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be so essentially what, what Paul is teaching us through the story of Elijah is that in this story, you have an entire nation that has rebelled and begun worshiping an idol. They've wandered and walked away from God. There is a remnant within this mass crowd who has not bent their knee to Baal and they've not worshiped the idol and God's kept that remnant and he's gonna bring that remnant out of his judgment. So he's not going to bring uh, his judgment upon all of them. He's going to bring a remnant out that he's going to use. And that remnant's going to continue his story moving forward. You see, the outward appearance may suggest at times when you look at a country or when you look at a nation that all is lost. But God, because of grace, looks farther. And within the crowd, what we often don't see is that the work of God is present. And within the crowd, the work of God is at work bringing about a people that will come back to him, that will follow him and love him and worship him. And so just because you can't see the remnant doesn't mean that the grace of God isn't 
present. And, and so th this is kind of the big idea that Paul is painting for us. If you flip over to Psalm 103, there's this incredible Psalm about the grace of God. The grace that's being spoken of in verses four and five, uh, or excuse me, five and six. And, and it's a beautiful Psalm. I just wanna read it to you to give you context of the patience of the God that we serve. Psalm 103, verse eight, it says this, the Lord is merciful and gracious. That is to say that his character is that. He doesn't have emotional moments where he's merciful and gracious. He doesn't have an, an emotional outburst where he's uh, crazy generous in a moment and then in another moment retracts that generosity back. Instead, he is merciful and gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the rest, west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. <laughs> as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame and he remembers our dust. That's the grace of God. Now there's some lessons that we see from this remnant, what God does in the story of Elijah. Three quick lessons. Number one, the Lord demonstrates that the perception of others will not determine the believer's future. The perception of others will not determine the believer's future. There's perhaps one of the most confounding things that I struggle with uh, when it comes to my faith, it's not the moral atheist. There, there is a such thing as a moral person who's not a believer of God. I, I, I can reconcile that to the fact that we're image bearers of God and we still bear the Imagio Dei. And there's some incredible people who are not followers of God who are, by the world standards, extremely generous and kind. That doesn't cause me to have a crisis of faith. What causes me to have a crisis of faith is the immoral Christian. In fact, I'm shocked by my own immorality sometimes. And perhaps you've had this reality too, where you're shocked at how sinful Christian people can at times be. You don't wanna say amen to that because they're sitting beside you, I understand. That's why you brought them to church. But the story of grace, when you look at the story of Elijah and God's mercy towards Israel, even though the nation in mass has rebelled against God, is that we learn that God does not allow Elijah's perception, who was a godly person and a prophet, or anyone else's perception to hinder him from his, what he sees and knows about people. And we know that God looks further uh, than the surface. He looks at the heart. We first get, when we learn about the, the history of the kings in Israel in the Old Testament, a king that is taller than everyone else, that looks the part that would be great for parades. But he's a terrible king. The, the other king seems to be just as big of a mess if you don't know the backstory on him, right? I mean, this is a guy that commits adultery, speaks first and has to apologize later. Uh, sometimes charges in a little bit, uh, charges into crowds of people and starts fights. Uh, is very brave, but very short. <laughs> and uh, this king we're known as, is known as the king after God's own heart because when God looked at his heart, he knew that though this person may make mistakes, this person will always pursue and have a heart that, that bends towards God. And so we have a God that doesn't look at you in your rebellion and just dismiss you because other Christian people do the same. We serve the God who looks below the surface. And we serve the God who doesn't allow other people's perceptions to determine your future. And that, my friends, is the grace of God. He doesn't bring you up and say, what do you think we should do with this one? He's never polled an audience about what to do with you. Here's my question to you. At what point could someone have justly cried out against you as Elijah cried out against the nation of Israel? And if Elijah has a legit argument to cry out against the nation of Israel, others perhaps have a legit argument against you. My point is simply this. When you get to the point where you're exasperated with someone who professes to be a believer of God and you wanna wash your hands with them, let me simply remind you that the grace of God doesn't simply wash his hands of you and your rebellion. Therefore, you should not wash your hands of other believers as well just because they've hurt you, betrayed you, or surprisingly been way more sinful than you thought they could be. Now, I know I'm meddling now because I'm getting up in your business. 
But this is a great point to learn from the story of Elijah and the remnant. The perception of others will not determine the believer's future. Number two, the second thing that we learn is that even when the outlook is grim, there is work to do. Right in the middle of all of this chaos and what I would call Elijah's meltdown, uh, you get 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15. It says this, and the Lord said to Elijah, go return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall appoint to be the king over Israel and Elijah, the son of Shaphat of Abel Meholah. Is that pronounced correctly? The answer is good enough. <clears throat> you shall anoint to be the prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall be put to death as well. Here's the point. Right in the middle of this chaos, Elijah, Elijah gets work to do. So just because the remnant seems to have rebelled doesn't mean that the believers get to pack it up and go home. And this is the point. There are going to be moments, and I, I talked about this semi-passionately the other week about this Texas thing where everyone's trying to get out of California and go to Texas because, you know, people there seem to have uh, more values that align with yours and other stuff like that. All, all of this, all this stuff that's going on, it, it's completely counter kingdom thinking. I'm just going to be blunt with you again. Uh, it's this idea that your life belongs to you, that you should live in a place of comfort, that you deserve it. It's an American, and which is an American thought, by the way, that we all deserve to have this cushy retirement where we live someplace nice, where you know we have stacks of money that the government doesn't try and take from us. Okay, um, well, I'm all for not stealing. <laughs> And I'm all for good, comfortable circumstances. I just spent a week in Avila, okay? Like I can't, I can't really say like I've been like the calluses of my hands as I've worked. Let, let me just simply put it to you this way. We have been tasked with a uh, eternal mission and a temporal amount of time to get it done. And there are gonna be times where you're gonna be greatly discouraged. And you're gonna look at the crowd around you and there's not gonna be any encouragement coming from them. And you're gonna to begin to think to yourself, it's time to pack it in and play it safe. And in that moment, you're gonna think that it would be easier almost to just put up really big walls around yourself and wall yourself in than it would be to, to engage the scary world that, that seems to be going to hell in a handbasket around you. And it's in that moment where I think we can learn this lesson from what, what we're learning about the remnant of how God works. And that is simply this, if you are a believer of God, there is work to do. And if it seems to be dark, there's more work to do. And if it seems that the cost is high, trust me, this is an honorable work that we get to do. Second thing we learn, even when it looks grim, there's work to do. And finally, number three, the grace of God was in the mess. The grace of God was in the mess. And this is what Paul's point is. He is an Israelite. And the majority of Israelites have, have turned from God. They've turned their back on God. But he, being an Israelite, walks with God. And as a result of that, you cannot dismiss all Israelites and say that God's not been faithful to his promise. Furthermore, you've got a story where an entire nation was worshiping Baal. And there was one prophet of God left. One. It's not like we're down to our last three or four. There's one. I mean, literally, we're at last, last prophet. I mean, this is like last hope moment, which means in Bakersfield is when we would respond because we wait to the last minute to do everything. It's like a cultural norm, right? That's why you do not want to go to Walmart today. You might get stabbed. <laughs> not by a terrorist, by a teacher trying to get some supplies for her schoolroom. <laughs> Sorry, I had to put that in context, sadly, because of everything that's going on in our country. Uh, no, the grace of God was in the mess. And this is what we see. If you look back at the text, out of this mess of uh, a nation, there's 7,000 people that have not bent their knee to Baal. And God says, I've kept them. I've kept them to keep my story moving forward. So what we see in this first part, as far as what God has done through Christ and what God continues to do with the nation of Israel, and for that matter, those who reject God, is he continues to give us this time of common grace. What we see is God using a remnant in the mess 
to move his story forward. The remnant may be one like Elijah or maybe 7,000 that Elijah can't see that haven't bowed their knee to the idol god Baal. But nonetheless, there's a remnant that has work to do that is continuing through the grace of God to be faithful to the work of God in a very difficult season. So uh, this idea of remnant is not new. It's something that we see in the Old Testament. It's something we see in the New Testament. So here's what I wanna simply say to you right now. If you are dismissing entire groups of people because it seems like the majority, all of them are, are against God. I had someone tell me the other day, and this is amazing to hear stuff like this, but I had someone say to me, like out blinking an eye, well, people in India are evil. I'm like, well, that's a broad statement for like a billion people. They just, they, just, they just tend to do, and it starts going into it because he had a bad experience with a person who represented that group. Listen, church, now more than ever, it's our job to stop broad stroke condemning people and start understanding that God is at work in all of the world. He, he, he's at work in Iraq and he's at work in Bakersfield. He's at work in Button Willow and he's at work in Egypt. Like you, 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 you've got to stop with this line of thinking that thinks that God works here, but he's not at work there. That God's grace is here, but his grace doesn't work there. Th this is ridiculous. There are more Christians in Iraq than there are in Boston right now. But for many of you, you would broad stroke the nation of Iraq as being godless or absent from the presence of God. When in reality, there is a great revival work that's happening there. Is it painful? Yes. Is it broken? Yes. Is God at work in a remnant? Yes. Does this make sense? So Paul answering this question emphatically says, listen, God is still at work. The story is not done. His grace is abounding. His, his workers are still in the field. And then in verse seven, we get a transitional verse. Look at it with me really quick. Verse seven, it says this. What then? Has Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking? Paul's answer, the elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. This is rough. Basically saying, don't be gracious. I mean, that, <laughs> okay, verse 11. Not that any of you have ever asked for God to bring wrath and not grace to someone. Moving on. So I asked, did they stumble in order that, that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles in as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles and I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. Okay, uh, we're gonna learn in this about God's discipline versus God's punishment. Now, Paul quotes in verse eight, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse four. To give you some greater context, let's read verses four to six. So Paul quotes verse eight, Deuteronomy 29, four to six. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. This is uh, God speaking to Israel. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. This gives us some key context. Okay, so 40 years prior, God had broken this people who were not a people from Egypt. They had a promise of a land that was overflowing with milk and honey. They get to the border of that land. Are you tracking with me? And they send 12 spies out. Two spies say move forward into the future on faith. 10 spies say run in fear and retreat. As a result of following the voice of the majority, the nation of Israel has wondered, not like wondered like what happened, wondered as in how much longer, how much longer for 40 years, okay? Paul makes a point now to point out 
that what God did in this 40 year period was not punish Israel, but discipline them. Now this is tough. Because many of us read this and go, he punished them. No, he disciplined them. Let me explain. In that 40 year time frame, look at what it says in verse five of Deuteronomy chapter 29. Your clothes have not worn out on you. Your sandals have not worn off your feet. You have not, uh, you have not eaten bread and you have not drunk wine or strong drink that you may know that I am the Lord your God. I've not given you coping mechanisms to minimize the pain. And though I've not taken away the pain, I have sustained you in the pain so that as you walk in the pain of your rebellion, you will understand that I am disciplining you, not dismissing you, not, uh, not bringing condemnation upon you, but I am sustaining you and disciplining you to know that I am God and I alone alone can be trusted and depended upon. What, God, what is God doing? God is disciplining a nation, not punishing a nation. And we learn the difference between these two in this story. What we learn is that the wandering in the wilderness gave the nation of Israel time to see God's faithful provision. This was a God that they were getting to know. They had seen him do powerful things in Egypt, but they didn't have the faith that they needed to trust them to do powerful things in the land that he was calling them to in their future. Many of you can trust God with your past, but you've not learned to trust God with the future. So what God often will do is give you a wilderness to walk in. And in that wilderness, things are difficult. Things are tough. But God, his light shines bright in the darkness of that wilderness and he sustains you and he teaches you how to be truly zealous and dependent upon him. So what we see in the discipline of God in the story is that he allowed them to wander and gave them time to see his faithful provision. Number two, the rebellious within Israel who didn't believe God could are given ample time through the way God sustains them in the wilderness to then come to repentance. Both are a grace of God. Boast the goodness of God, the grace of God to allow them to wonder and see his provision so they can grow in their faith and the grace of God to allow those who doubt the provision of God to see the provision of God and repent and come to faith in God. This is a grace that God gives. Then he moves into verse nine when he quotes David and he quotes a Psalm. It's Psalm 69 verse 20 and it's a Psalm of lament. Look at it with me. Psalm 69, 20. Reproaches have, been, have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food. And for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Let their own table be before them a snare. And when they are at peace, let it become a trap. And let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning and your anger overtake them. This is what we call punishment. And there's a big difference between the punishment of God and the grace of God between these two texts. Or the discipline of God, excuse me. So, so let me just really quick, because I don't have a ton of time, point these two things out. If you are being disciplined by God, it is an opportunity for you in a difficult circumstance to see the sufficiency of and provision of God, which will lead, because he loves you, to progress and sanctification. So some of you right now, perhaps got to a promised land, didn't have the faith to depend on God, or you looked to depend on yourself and you acted sinfully. God didn't punish you. Instead, he disciplined you because he loves you. It says so in Hebrews, God disciplines those that he loves so he's let you wonder for a little bit and he sustains you and he's given you time to see how his hand can work in difficult times so that through seeing the discipline of God you will come to repentance and dependency upon God are you tracking with me when God brings punishment which he does it looks completely different Punishment is permanent, punitive, and retributive. And yes, it's that, that painful. When God brings punishment, it's permanent, punitive, and retributive. Meaning, when he brings judgment upon a people, those people usually aren't standing on the other side of it. 
Ever read the story of Ananias and Sapphira? They withheld, the, they, they, they masqueraded generosity and withheld a large portion for themselves. That was evil. God didn't bring discipline. He brought punishment. And guess what happened? Three, two, one, you did. So if you're breathing, chances are that is a common grace or a sign of sonship. And I mean sonship. You've been received as sons of God into his kingdom, and he is disciplining you. If you're not breathing, then chances are you've experienced the punishment of God. Uh, this is a true story. I hesitate telling it, but um, there were some friends of mine. They lived up the road, uh, and they were two twin brothers, and their father passed away when they were about eight. Uh, a door-to-door -door preacher knocked on their door. This is in South Carolina on Painter Road, right where I live. And said, hey, I would like to share with you uh, about God and the gospel. Do you have any time to talk to their father? And their father was a very uh, bitter, mean man. Said to the man, I don't need no G blank preacher to come up in here and blank, 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 blank. And went on a tirade. Not making this up. He turned to go back into his house, had a heart attack, and died. He's lion and he's lamb. Many of you, because of Jesus, only understand him to be lamb. But he's alpha and omega. He is your creator. There should be a holy tremble and a reverent fear that comes from the idea of sinning in the presence of a holy God. And what Paul is trying to get across to the nation of Israel and to the church is that God's discipline differs from his punishment. And then he ends this chapter, this little section of what we're looking at in verse 14. He ends this section and idea by laying out what God's plan in history currently is. And he uses the word jealous twice. Did you catch it when we read it? Really quick, look at it with me. Verse 10. Uh, he says, let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel, here's the word, jealous. Skip down again with me. Verse 14, I think it is again. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order that somehow to make my fellow Jews, here's the word, jealous. So what is God doing now? Okay, in history, two things that we learned. Number one, God's plan right now has allowed for a season for non-believers, to, to give non-believers ample time to hear, believe, and be saved. God's plan in history is allowing time for non-believers, the opportunity to hear, believe, and be saved. That doesn't make sense, what's on the screen. That's a typo that got through because I was in Avla typing this out. <laughs> God's plan allows non-believers ample opportunity to hear, believe, and be saved. There we go. Number two, this current season that we're in in history should, by the grace of God, evoke jealousy in the life of the straying remnant of Israel. I want you to think about this. In the Abrahamic covenant, God was going to bless the people to be a blessing to the nations so that the nations would, in, in a sense, envy and be jealous of the God that's at work with Israel and they would come and, de and desire more. Here's what Paul's essentially saying. In history right now, the church is being blessed by God to be a blessing to the nations to such an extent that there will be a time where the remnant of Israel would look and see the provision of God for the church. And it would evoke jealousy and a desire to know more about that God. Here's what I'm trying to say. If you're living the Christian life well, not because of money and material and all this pseudo gospel stuff that we get tied up in. If we're living the gospel well because of the goodness of our Father, it should evoke jealousy from the world around us. Consider this. 
It, it should cause the, 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 the looking, non-believing world to look at your life and go, I can't buy what they have, but I want it. It should cause them to look at our marriage and go, I want that kind of relationship, but I cannot, through psychobabble or through self-help, find the, the depth of a marriage that looks like that. There must be a third strand, something extra that's at work in that marriage that makes it that good. Here, here's perhaps the greatest problem. The majority of the onlooking, non-believing world looks at us and goes, we can pass. And it's not for the lack of the goodness of the Father, but perhaps it's for the lack of the devotion of the people. Which brings me to my last point as Jim comes and leads us in this time of response, and it's simply this. God desires desperation from his people. We talked about a distinctive at the beginning of the message of being a church that is intentionally multicultural. Well, well one of our other distinctives is that we are going to be a church that is desperate for Jesus. What does that mean? It means that we're going to make repentance normal. It means that we're going to pursue Jesus with passion outwardly. We're not going to be silent in our praise for the goodness of God. When we see God do the miraculous, we're going to shout it from the mountains and the rooftops. Right? We're not going to be ashamed of the gospel. But we're going to live a life that doesn't make sense apart from the goodness and the work of Christ. We are dependent on Jesus. We, I've called it my declaration of dependence. I daily have to make a declaration of dependence. Some of us love the declaration of independence. I love that one too. I think it's great. But I love a declaration of dependence on God. Amen. And I believe it's something that we've been called to do. And what God, I believe, is looking for is a people who in his grace rise up and declare dependency upon him and allow him to do through them what he, they can't, cannot do in and of themselves. So today, as we come to this time of response, I simply want to ask a few questions. Our prayer team's going to come forward. We're going to stand to our feet and sing a few questions. Number one, are you currently, if you profess to be a believer, desperate for Jesus? Or has the, the passion and the familiarity of Christ led to an indifferent, lukewarm pursuit? Are you desperate for Jesus? Number two, number two, the second big thing. Are you currently living, embracing and thanking God for his discipline, which proves that you are sons of God? Are you thanking God for the moments where he let you wander, but he provided and he sustained you and in his grace gave you ample time to come home? Finally, number three, because I'm a Baptist and you've got to have three takeaways. If you, through the hearing of this message today, came into church and you realize, you know what, I'm not really a follower of Christ. I want to submit to you that you're in a season of common grace. And God has given you the time to observe how ungodly you are and how much in need of him you are. And today he would invite you and I invite you in this time as our prayer team's here to come forward and surrender your life to Jesus. So if you don't know what that looks like, it looks like you leaving your seat, coming down front and saying, help me. Tell me what it means to be a follower of Christ because I don't know. And one of these people at the altar would love to pre meet and pray with you today. Whatever it is the Lord is doing, you move as the Lord leads in Jesus' name. Amen.